And welcome to Salon Talks. Today, very happy to welcome award-winning journalist Mehdi Hassan. You see him on MSNBC hosting his own show, also on Peacock. And he's got a brand new book out called Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. Mehdi, welcome to Salon Talks. Good to see you. Dean, thanks for having me. We wanted to do this for a while. So congratulations on the new book. You know, it's interesting, in the book you write, I prefer not to avoid arguments. I seek them out, rush towards them. I relish and savor them. Tell people, why do you enjoy fighting with people so much? <laughs> well, first of all, Dean, it takes one to know one. I'm pretty sure that you enjoy it as much as I do, because uh, I listen to your show, I follow you on Twitter, I read your pieces. I think we're both uh, disputatious individuals. I say in the book, perhaps it's a result of my upbringing. I grew up in a very disputatious household. My father uh, encouraged debate and argument around the dinner table on long drives, even on family vacations. My sister and I, we sparred over many issues, still do. Um, it's kind of my background childhood, and maybe there's something in me as well that just loves the idea of rhetorical combat. But the case I make in the book is it's not just about your personality. It's not just about something you instinctively like doing or are good at doing. It's something we all do. Everyone in the world, every single person watching this has at some point or another tried to win an argument, needed to win an argument, wanted to win an argument. And my contention in the book is anyone can win an argument. Let me show you how. And have you thought of starting like Mehdi Hassan's Fight Club? Like you meet, <laughs> go around the country, meet in the basement of a bar or something. Uh, you got to you got to add in a word in, in parentheses: rhetorical Fight Club. I, right, right, rhetorical I can't do club. I can't do real Edward Norton, Brad Pitt style Fight Clubs. I say in the book, there's a chapter on judo moves. I talk yes. about how debating involves uh, rhetorical judo, unbalancing your opponent, knocking them off balance when they're least expecting it. And I make it clear: I don't know how to do judo. This is rhetorical judo. And the you know what i was thinking like you're giving away your secrets right and it reminds me you see the movie Patton, where Patton no, fights no, no. okay okay so Patton george he's got fights he's Patton, and he battles rommel and he beats rommel and on the battlefield and he yells out rommel you magnificent bastard i read your book and he did read his book on strategy and that's what he used to defeat rommel so i've read your book i'm ready yeah. let's do this like that's... are you concerned that some don't... of your guests are going to read your book oh no i no. i am my younger daughter actually said this to me dean while i was writing she's like i don't understand why are you giving it all away how are you going to do interviews i would say a few things in response to that number one i'm a generous soul i just want to share you're a giver uh, number two i would say that um you know, I'm ready. Let's. I want to improve the quality of debate in this country. I want to improve interviews on air. Something you know, I've lived here for eight years. I've been on uh, MSNBC for two years, on Peacock for nearly three years. I want to improve what goes on on television, on broadcast media. So if my colleagues can take away stuff from this, if guests can take away, you know, how to communicate with it, that's good for all of us. Look, serious point. That is good for all of us. You and I have discussed before some of the failings of our quote unquote mainstream media when sure. it comes to holding power to account. So I'm all in favor of tougher interviews and, you know, especially my colleagues, if they can use this. If guests use it, bring it on. Uh, Congressman Ro Khanna, who we both know, uh, he actually tweeted a, a link to the book and said, I'm going to buy this and read it before I go on Mehdi Hassan's show next time. So I'm ready for that. What I would I would say one small thing. Sure. Okay, read the book. I, I do outline a lot of my secrets in there. Number one, not all of them. Right. And number two, you know, it takes practice. You know, one of the chapters is about practice. Mm -hmm. Practice them. I mean, I've got a 20 year head start on a lot of the people who are going to be reading the book. So good luck to you. As I say, bring it on. As you said at the start, I love a good, I love a good round. So if you were to give this book as a gift to one of your colleagues at MSNBC, that might not be a compliment. That might be like, hey, Eamon Mohadeen, you might want to read this so you can get better at what you're doing. I'm just putting Eamon as a straw yes, man. Eamon is a fantastic interview. I know, I'm um, kidding. I, just I would it. say, no, of course, of course. I have sent it to many journalists in the right. industry, uh, including at my network, at other networks. And I've only had, thank God, touch wood, uh, positive feedback from colleagues. Some I, I, An unnamed anchor at another network sent me a very nice note saying, I loved seeing how you prepare behind the scenes because A, right. it was similar to what I do, but B, it also gave me ideas. And I love that. I love the fact of like sharing good practices. And look, I say in the book, it's part how to, but it's also part memoir. You don't have, you, there are, there are better interviewers out there than me. If they want to read the book, please do read the book. Not necessarily for tips, but just to read some good stories. I have some fun stories about people I've clashed with over the years from inside the Saudi consulate. Yes, I came out alive to the former heavyweight champion of the world, Vitaly Klitschko, now leading his city's defense uh, against an illegal Russian invasion to various celebrities and others. So there's some fun stories in there as well about 
fun arguments and debates and interviews I've had in weird places. Right. And a lot of those interviews you mentioned, I had seen clips even before I knew you or now I've gotten to know you better now of, of you battling people. It's great. But you give real practical advice. There's one kind of unique thing we're living through now, though, and I got to get you to share this yeah. with people. And, and I have it on my radio show. People call on the right and it's not like I'm fact checking them in that they're lying. They actually think the facts, what they know yeah. are facts and they're not facts. And they've been, I've learned not to get mad at them because they've yeah. been misled. Yeah. And they literally think like, well, I was told this by, let's say Fox News, or I read this at Daily Caller or whatever right-wing publication, which has misled these good people. Yeah. So how do you debate people when they yeah. have their own set yeah. of facts and it's not malicious? They, they go, that's not, that's the facts. How dare you say it's not the facts? So it's a great question. And I spend a lot of time in the book trying to address this point because I, I, I'm frustrated as much as you are, Dean. Uh, you know, I, I said after Donald Trump won in 2016, I said to a colleague of mine, I was at Al Jazeera English, let's just jack it all in. Let's just, just go be accountants. Not that there's anything wrong with being accountants, but like, what is the point of doing what we do if there are tens of millions of people out there who think, who just believe this nonsense? And again, in 2020 with QAnon and the election lie and the big lie and all the denialism. Uh, I would say two things, and I address this in a, at a couple of chapters in the book. There's a chapter in the book called uh, Beware the Gish Galloper, mm -hmm. and it references this idea of people on the right who push misinformation deliberately. Not the people you're talking about. I'll talk right. to the people you're talking about in a moment, the kind of people who believe it. I'm talking about the pushers of misinformation, the bad faith merchants, the BS artists, the con men. And there's a chapter in that, how do you deal with people like that? Because they're not arguing in good faith and simply reciting a bunch of statistics to them or bringing you receipts is not gonna work. And I talk about in the book about how you have to expose the strategy. Remember, often in an argument, you're not trying to change the other person's mind. We're trying to win over the third person, the audience, the neutrals watching. We spend a lot of time arguing with another person, forgetting about the audience who are key to this, especially you and I who have audiences as part of our profession. But it's not just professional journalists, whether you're in a boardroom doing a business deal, whether you're in school or college, wherever you are, there's an audience. So I talk about the need to win over the audience, expose the strategy, call it out, I say. Don't budge when they try and run over you with a torrent of bullshit. Um, and, you know, pick your battles. When these people come at you with nonsense, they throw a hundred lies at you, a hundred conspiracy theories. You can't bat them all away. Don't even bother trying. Pick the most absurd one, take that one apart to expose the entire nonsensical strategy. So that's the three-part guide I talk about in the book to dealing with a gish galloper. But then there's the people who believe the gish gallop, as you say, the, the people who are arguing not maliciously, but they believe this stuff. I think with them, you have to find a bond. If you're going to try and get through to them. Personally, I think a lot of these people are lost, sadly. Sorry to sound so pessimistic, mm -hmm. but I do believe a lot of these people are lost. But the people you think you can convince, I do think throwing facts and figures is not going to work, as you say, because they have their own facts and figures, alternative facts. Um, I think what you have to do is find a way to identify with them on a personal level. You have to get through people here, not just through here. That is key. Emotion, um, appealing to people's identity, not just their interests, is a very important way of bonding. What is a shared identity that you have? I tell the story in the book of where I'm sitting in front of a small C conservative audience in rural England on a live BBC radio panel show. And I'm asked to defend the rights of a terror suspect uh, who is being, um, in, back in 2009, 10, I think it was, the UK government wanted to extradite a terror suspect to Jordan where he would be tortured. And I was making the argument that shouldn't happen. We should be against that. It was an elderly white crowd. I was the only brown dude in the entire room. Right. And I, what do I do? How do I get through to these people? They're not going to, they don't care if I cite a report from Amnesty International or the European Convention on Human Rights. What do I talk about? I talked about British history. I talked about the history of British liberty. I talked about the Magna Carta of 1215 AD, the first constitutional document in British history. I talked about what Britain was great for and why were we sacrificing those liberties and traditions simply for this one guy. And I got applause from the crowd, not because they instantly agreed with me that moment, but because I found a common ground that we all shared, we all agreed upon. I got them to identify with me. We were all in this together. And you make a great point in the book about knowing your audience. Like when you're doing a debate with someone, know who you're, who yeah. is your goal audience? Who are you trying to, trying to persuade people is impossible. Like I had a, a listener call my show, a right winger. And I remember this vividly. He calls up and says, Biden has open borders. And I go, what do you mean open borders? He goes, the borders are, there's no border control. I'm like, so no one working at the, the, the little toll booths? Like they've all went home, they're like sitting home watching TV. And there's this long pause. He goes, you shut up. Like that was his answer to me because no one, 
had said any rebuttal in real life to him. He just with his friends going, it's open border. Yeah, it's open border. Can you believe it's open border? But These also, are facts. you did something else fantastic there, which is another chapter in my book, which is you didn't come back with number of how many border patrol officers are employed by the Biden administration. You made a joke that right. some, everyone could understand and you're fantastic at that. And that got through to him in a way that a bunch of statistics wouldn't have done. And you have the, we'll touch on that. There's something else you talk about here and you were sort of touching when, when you hit your chest and the idea of pathos and ethos. And you talk about in your book, the example of Mike Dukakis, 1988 yeah. presidential debate, very famous thing, asked yeah. about if his wife, God forbid, was raped, how would he respond? And he gave statistics and this kind of answer that had no emotion. Or, And you also cite a great book from years ago, Drew Weston's book, The yeah. Political Brain, which I used to cite to people all the time. I tried yeah. to get him on my show years ago. Explain to people why in a debate that if you just give numbers folks yeah people's eyes are going to gloss over if you're on yeah. tv if you're on the radio you can give one or two pick the data exactly. points selectively but moving people is how you win so please share well you have to go back to even to dale carnegie and his book about you know we are emotional creatures not logical creatures we we're told in debate class we're told what my, my daughter's in high school doing high school debate you're taught about how to make the argument and the impact and the warrant and the claim and the evidence that's all great in theory right. in real life people do not respond to statistics on their own i'm not saying drop facts and figures as you say that's a mistake too you need a factual underpinning to anything you're trying to say you need to bring your receipts as i say in one of the chapters in the book but the way you're going to get through to people is by convincing them at an emotional level. Aristotle told us this over 2,000 years ago with the pathos argument, the appeal to emotion, not just to logos, but to pathos. And I think that is absolutely key. A lot of Democrats have never quite understood that, never taken it on board. The Democratic Party's approach to political debate is to assume that everyone is some rational calculator sitting and going, well, that tax plan will give me... $2,200 more than that tax plan. Therefore, I will vote for that tax plan. That is not how people vote. I've never met anyone who goes into a voting booth based on just a kind of having gone through all the policy documents. And there's a reason why there have been six presidential elections in this century, and Democrats have won three and lost three. And the ones they lost were John Kerry, Al Gore, and Hillary Clinton. What did they all have in common? They they recited dry policy. They didn't treat, and Drew Weston's book is called The Political Brain. He says the political brain is an emotional brain. Mm -hmm. It's not a rational or a logical brain. You have to people appeal to people's emotions. In 2016, we know Hillary Clinton had the better platform. We know she had the policies that would have helped Americans with childcare, with healthcare, the environment. But Donald Trump had ban Muslims, build a wall. He was appealing demagogically to his supporters, to their base instincts of fear, paranoia, anger, bigotry. I'm not saying you should appeal to those emotions, but you have to appeal to some emotions. You have to have an emotional guess. Al Gore, you remember Al Gore? It was all about fuzzy math. Uh, yeah. You know, this was, this, this, yeah, this is a problem for Democrats in that, I don't know what it is. Is it the liberal arts education, the law school background? You can't even blame law school. I used to blame law school, but then again, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, both lawyers, they were able to do it. They sure. were able to appeal to people's emotions, use soaring rhetoric, connect with people on an instinctive level. You know, I tell the story in the book of Bill Clinton at a town hall in 1992 with George H.W. Bush, where a woman asks, how does the national debt affect you personally? George H.W. Bush gives a long answer about interest rates and going on tour and how it's important to cut the deficit. Bill Clinton stands up off the stool, goes over to the woman, looks her in the eye and says, how did it affect you? That is connecting with people on an emotional level. That is how you win millions of people over. And I think it's so important to be authentic. Joe Biden has that authenticity. I have many criticisms of Joe Biden's presentation and oratorical skills, but he has an authenticity which allowed him to connect with people in a way that other Democrats come across as wooden or stiff or calculators. And I think that is so important to make the emotional argument. You know, the heart steers the head. And if it's heart versus head, the heart will win. Yeah, and you, it was interesting you cited that exchange and, and George Bush, the father, looking at his watch famously yes. and showing that he was kind of bored with it. I played that clip of Bill Clinton on my show as a guide for people on how do you respond with empathy that touches okay. people? And that's how you do it. You re And why Democrats, some are better at it now. I yes. mean, Barack Obama was, was uniquely gifted at that. I think with Biden, it's not like he tries to do it. I think what you're getting at is the authenticity of a man who has personally lost so much, yes. who lost his his wife and child early on and lost his son as an adult, and how that just changes you as a person. You know, I've lost my father. It has an impact on on how I see the world. And you connect. So I think it was unintentional. One, one quick other example, Dean, that just comes to me is John Fetterman. 
Like the Republicans yeah. tried to throw the idea that this guy had a stroke, he's not fit for us. That helped Fetterman. People connected with, oh, he's got a problem that I have a problem, that my parents have that problem. That right. enabled him to connect with people in a very authentic, emotional way. So you mentioned your daughter's taking debate. Do you think, and by the way, when you read Mehdi's book, it's also a guide to learning critical thinking if you haven't done it before, because it really is teaching you very law school-esque as a lawyer, I'd say this, what about look at the sources, question the sources, uh, you know, get the receipts, which is prepare your facts, that the, the key to a winning argument is not just emotion, it's a factual underpinning. And, and I take that as, as a lawyer. But do you think debate should be mandatory in school across this country? Yeah, I do. I think there's enough mandatory courses. that they, There's no reason not to be. I have no expert on the curriculum. And I think we've got bigger fights to fight about the curriculum, especially in places like Florida. But right. yes, I think, as you, you very eloquently put it there, it's not just about debate or argument or rhetoric. It is about critical thinking. The reason I love debating and arguing is because you are exploring the basis for something. You're not uncritically or blindly accepting stuff. And to go back to your earlier question, like something I learned as a kid from my dad was like, question everything. Question apps, don't just take things. Because, and, you know, we live in an age of social media where people just forward stuff on WhatsApp and you're like, oh, that's a picture of Syria. No, it's not a picture of Syria. It might be from somewhere else. Like there's a lot of fake news out there and we've just uncritically accepted it on our Twitter feeds or Facebook pages or WhatsApp. And I want people to interrogate everything. I think we would be in a much better off place, especially with all the conspiracy theories that are floating around. If people were taught critical thinking, people were taught the art of good faith debate. And people were also taught, uh, you know, Dean, I think you and I would agree on this, like, media diet like how to understand the media we have a lot of people today who just don't understand how the media works what is a reliable source what isn't a reliable source and i think media and political literacy is missing in our schools and that's why we're not creating the best of citizens right now we have one of the lowest turnouts uh, in the industrialized world when it comes to elections even though we have some of the most crucial elections in the western world right now i appreciate that you all, while you work in corporate media and so do i we both criticize corporate media all the time and it really hasn't caused problems for me yet. If I did it on air, that'd probably be different. But I can do it in articles, even for corporate publications, which is remarkable because like we're all online. You can criticize without saying names like corporate media in general. You talk about confidence in your book. You need confidence. But confidence only comes from practice. Yes. And you know, I used to tell people when I was a lawyer, I was paid to ask the question that you feel uncomfortable to ask, the awkward question, or to challenge someone for being a liar. You paid me to do that. They did. Like I'd go to deposition or a trial. And I would expose someone for being a liar. So people, but people, as opposed to you who relishes fighting, and I truly don't relish fighting, though I do love exposing people for being liars. I can't tell you how much joy that brings me. It brought me joy as a trial lawyer, and it brings me joy in conversations in real life when people try to articulate a position that, like, that's just not based on fact. But what do you say to people who are like, because you even give examples about asking your boss for a raise. It is inherently confrontational. What do you tell people about how to have the confidence to do it in a way that is productive for you, depending where you are. Like we're not, you're not always going to be on a radio show or TV show debating. Everyone goes their separate ways. It could be your boss. It could be your, your loved one. What do you yeah. tell them about that? So there's a few things I would say. I mean, first of all, I think again, just like with debate itself, which I believe can be taught, which I believe can be learned, which I believe can be developed. And I give examples in the book, people like Winston Churchill, who we all remember as this great orator who wins world war two with fight them on the beaches speeches for the British. Uh, had some really bad moments as a younger person, had a really bad stammer, lacked confidence, messed up his speeches in the commons, but he got through it. He learned his way through it. And I, I do genuinely believe anyone can learn this stuff. Um, the same applies to confidence. Confidence is not um, some fixed uh, innate attribute. It's something that we can develop and grow and expand. It is a belief in yourself and you have to work on that belief in yourself. And that applies across the board to anything you want to do in life. But in the context of my book, in terms of speaking in front of a crowd, and you know, there's one quote uh, from Seinfeld that I should have put in the book, but I didn't, but I love Jerry Seinfeld's quote, which is, you know, if you're at a funeral, the polls suggest that people are more afraid of speaking in front of a crowd than dying. So he says, if you're at a funeral, you'd prefer to be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Right. And that's how, you know, that's how much we lack confidence, how nervous we are about speaking. But there's nothing wrong with that. Cicero, the greatest orator of ancient Rome, was always nervous. And I'm, every time I stand up, I'm nervous. I talk about it in the book, like moments where I'm like, uh-oh. 
what's going to happen, even though I've been doing this for years. So the, the first point is, of course, you know, just recognizing the issue, acknowledging the issue, working on that issue. And I give tips in the book about how you can try and improve your confidence, how you can raise that game of yours, whether it's through actually things like visualizing success, which is a very important technique uh, used by some of the great athletes of our time, to basic stuff that people forget about. Like, And I say this in the book very honestly, surround yourself with the right people. One yeah. of the reasons we lack confidence is because either we're very negative or the people around us are very negative. And I say in the book, like the people you surround yourself with have an impact on you. I wouldn't have been able to get to where I am today were it not for people in my family, friends, colleagues who have helped me get to there and, and given me that boost, whether on the day, in the moment or over time. And then I also talk about faking it. Confidence is something you can and should fake at times. And there's times I've had to fake confidence and I talk about it in the book, but it's key because without that, if you ask me what is the most vital thing you have to have in order to win an argument it is confidence i mean look at donald trump there's no scenario in which he would be president of the united states in 2016 there's no scenario he could have got to that job without having ludicrous amount of overconfidence in his own abilities uh, and in his ability to get to that job and to you know bs his way through interviews debates etc cetera, etc cetera. it's through right and you can even be confident in saying you don't know like you could say well, I don't know. That's when they were like, you know what? I don't know, but I'm going to find an answer. And yeah. there's ways of answering that because I've learned. You can be confident in a concession. And I talk right. in the book about the importance of, and you know, this is a lawyer. Sometimes you just go, okay, that one, just going to let that one go. I concede that one because I'll come back later with a stronger point. Don't double down on something that you're losing on. And that again requires confidence, the confidence to know, you know what? I'm just going to say, yeah, I don't know. Or yeah, you got me. I'm, you got me on that one. I, I give up. You have so many different practical advices that you give in the book. And I know everyone's going to think, well, if there was one thing that Mehdi Hassan was going to tell me to do before an important debate, because you have yeah. stuff on public speaking as well, but just a debate. Is yeah. there one thing that really is your touchstone that you go to when you're getting yes. ready? Yes, it's John Stuart Mill's advice in On Liberty, which is you cannot know your own side of the argument without knowing the other side of the argument. The problem we have is we live in a world of confirmation bias. We surround ourselves with, I mentioned earlier, with, surround ourselves with positive people, but don't just surround yourself with people who agree with you. That's one of the problem. We surround ourselves with people who agree with us. We fill our social media with people and sources that we agree with and we like reading. We, um, we assume that everything we know is true and that all the arguments are on our side. That is a deadly way to approach an argument. You have to steel man your argument. I say in the book, we know about straw manning. Straw manning is when you, when you uh, misrepresent your opponent's argument, you dumb it down in order to defeat the weakest version of it. That's right. easy. And we all know that. The harder thing to do is to steel man your own argument. That means make your own argument, sorry, steel man your opponent's argument so that when you go at it, you go at the strongest version of it so that you're ready for anything. You're ready for whatever fact, figure, argument that they can throw. There's no curveball. You don't turn up for an argument. You don't turn up for a negotiation in the boardroom. This applies to kind of businessmen, uh, businesswomen, entrepreneurs. You need to be ready for anything. And you can't be ready for anything unless you've done the preparation, you've done the practice. You know, um, Abraham Lincoln has that. There's a quote from Lincoln that, you know, if you give me several hours to cut down a tree, I'll spend most of those hours sharpening the axe. Because you have to be ready. And, and I just find people are either uh, uh, shy, they lack confidence, they're lazy, uh, they're intellectually arrogant, all of those, or a mix of the, all those factors. And that leads to people going into a debate, going into a negotiation, going into an argument unprepared. And there's no excuse for that. And people say to me, well, how did you get that? You know, how did you have that rebuttal? How did you have that quote? Because I put the time in. You know, when you see me in those clips, you mentioned earlier, some of those viral clips with Eric Prince or whoever it is, the Saudi ambassador. And I'm going, aha, but you said this. Like that, I didn't just pull that out of my backside on the day. That is something that me or my team have come up with over several days, several weeks of researching, reading, and not just reading, you know, the New York Times or whatever publication we think we like that agrees with us. Go read the publications of your opponents. If you're, if you're on the left, go read right-wing media. Uh, you know, understand where the other person is coming from. A, it's intellectually honest, but B, it's a tactical move. It enables you to know what's coming your way. And also you have a book on personal attacks. So don't forget, sometimes you got to go personal, folks, but it's got to be used the effective way. Got to so, be ad hominem attacks, get a bad rep. They're actually yeah. vital to undermining the credibility of your opponent. Goes back to Aristotle again. He called it ethos. Yeah, I remember being on, Joy Reid show with during the time of Trump, where some Republican congressman was a white guy, but it turned out I researched he had been an, he was an immigrant. People didn't know that he came here at five, 
And he was about immigrants. I'm like, but you yourself are an immigrant. And there's this weird pause because people are not talking. It's just a white guy. He's like, well, I am, you know, but I was brought here as a young age. And it was a, what a weird moment. But I'm like, that was all research because I will read. They tell me who I'm on against. There's not that many debates, but it used to be you're going to debate someone more on TV. Yeah. I would look up about the person as well. So, yes. you know, the facts. And, and in strict, in strict, you know, debating circles, whatever they teach you in college or high school, they'll say, oh, no, no, you don't play the man, you play the ball. The fact that that person's an immigrant is irrelevant to the argument about immigration at the southern border. That's not just not true. In the real world, of course, it's very relevant to point out that your opponent is either being hypocritical or being selective uh, or not being fully honest with the audience. That's, of course, relevant. And, and last thing, you debate a lot of people. Is there one person, living or dead, that you would love to debate that you haven't yet? Uh, okay, so so living, I always say Tony Blair because Tony oh. Blair uh, is someone I spent a lot of years covering. I, I went through a, a love-hate relationship with Tony Blair as a younger man, as a teenager. I was a huge Blair supporter in 1997, the end of 18 years of conservative government. Blair comes in, this young, fresh Labour leader, going to transform Britain. Then he invades Iraq with George W. Bush. I became one of his biggest critics in the British press. I never, by the time I became a public figure and interviewer, he was gone from power. He rarely does interviews these days. He does softballs with kind of easy interviews. I find him to be uh, as, as awful as he is. I find him to be a brilliant intellect, a brilliant speaker, a brilliant debater. I, and I've ne no one's really ever nailed him on Iraq. He always slips out on the Iraq war. I would love to spend a half an hour in, a, in, a, in front of a live audience going back and forth with Tony Blair on the Iraq war. Uh, and as for dead, I have to say the Hitch, Christopher Hitchens, who I knew a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, the late, great Christopher Hitchens. Uh, and I say great in debating terms. By the time he died, sadly, a lot of his views were anathema to me. But the early Hitchens I loved. Um, but he was just because he was simply a great debater. If you want to watch fun arguments on YouTube of someone destroying their opponents, watch Christopher Hitchens on Fox and elsewhere. I thought you were going to like say Cicero or someone. I think Socrates would be kind of cool because it's all questions, the Socratic method. But I learned a lot. Like, so you just be asking I questions. Think people I think I might have a chance with. Right. <laughs> well, Mehdi, again, congratulations. The brand new book is Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speeding. It's a great book for everyone. And it has practical advice, like if you're just going to use it in real life, to big picture things. Debating, you're going to go on TV or, or debating organization. So again, congratulations, my friend. I learned Thank a lot so from the much. book myself personally. I look forward to chatting with you in the future. It means a lot to me. I appreciate it, Dean.